I am thrilled today to have Ginger Hardage. Uh, Ginger is the founder of Unstoppable Cultures, right? And wow. she is an organizational culture expert. So we're talking today about organizational culture. Uh, Ginger is the former senior vice president of culture and communications at Southwest Airlines, which all of us know uh, was founded by Herb Kelleher. Tell us just a little bit about um, when, when Herb Kelleher started the company, right? How long after that did you come into the company and what was the culture like then? And what were you handed and what were you asked to create? So when I joined in 1990, my primary focus was on communications, public relations, those areas. And um, when Colleen stepped down um, as president of Southwest Airlines, I took over the culture aspects to okay. continue to nurture and shepherd that aspect of the organization. So what's an unhealthy corporate culture look like? What? Uh, well, he, here's one that a lot of people might identify with. Um, it, I don't know if you've ever watched the show Billions. Uh, it's on Showtime. Uh, but it, it's really about, uh, so it's, it's fictitious. It's about this corporation called Axe Capital. And boy, talk about an unhealthy culture. Uh, it's built on intimidation. Uh, it's okay. built on greediness. It's built on uh, fear. And um, so it, to me, that's the antithesis uh, of a healthy organization. It's extremely unhealthy. Um, people are pressured. Uh, people, mm. you know, it's, it's so bad that um, a lot of a suicide and illegal activities occur. So that is an unhealthy organization. So if, if someone has an unhealthy organization, and, and those are symptoms, obviously, of, of these deeper root issues that um, I, I, I I want to make sure I remember here correctly. So greediness and and there's pressure and and no. stuff going no. right. No, no, definitely no empathy in those organizations. There's no empathy in those organizations. We're going to get to empathy, but so you talk about three things that make up a healthy corporate culture. One of the things that it has to be in place is outstanding leadership in an organization. Um, yeah. so when it really starts at the top of setting the tone so people don't just look at what we say they look at what we do the foundation the healthy culture starts with outstanding leadership that's um, that is really exemplifying uh, and and living the values of that organization um, so that's what it starts with and it also starts with that shared those shared values in the organization mm -hmm. Southwest Airlines, our shared values were, uh, we were looking for employees who had a servant's heart, um, yeah. a, a fun, loving attitude, and also a warrior spirit. So at, in our organization, those were the shared values that we were all looking for, that sense of shared values where everyone um, knew what was expected, and um, there weren't really any questions. Um, so every, every new associate who came into the organization was filtered through those three prisms, right? As far as those, those three values. And could you repeat those again? Because maybe somebody wants to take some of those ideas. There, and that, I think that's so important because they're, they're unusual. And I, that's what makes values really come alive in an organization if they really are directly tied to that organization. Well, I wouldn't tie personally having a warrior spirit with having fun. So I, I, I okay find that kind of interesting. So maybe you might be talking right. about that. I'd be glad to talk about that. <laughs> so, so the warrior spirit um, for Southwest Airlines is really about working hard. So when you think okay. about when you think about an airline, we want to be on time. Everybody wants their luggage there. It takes a lot of dedication, a lot of um, um, precision uh, to pull that off. Um, you're in all kinds of different weather conditions. So we, it takes um, someone who has extreme dedication and focus to their job. Um, and so and it, it, is, it has to be a well-oiled machine because you've got so many elements and many of our organizations are that way. There's so many elements uh, right. that are required to make your product perfect. And uh, at Southwest, it was that dedication that 
focus on the job, that warrior spirit, to get your luggage loaded on to that aircraft, to, to make sure that everything's ready when, when the aircraft is ready to launch, that all the maintenance has been done. Every, uh, the aircraft is ready to go. So, so did, did I get those right? So the first one was a servant spirit? Was that, was that the first one? Well, the uh, warrior spirit is how we started. Say that and again? Warrior, warrior. Warrior spirit, spirit right? And, and then servant's heart. Servant's so heart. It's not, and then uh, fun loving. Have, have fun, fun loving. Yeah. Fun okay. loving. So servant's heart is all about, um, it's Southwest was a customer service business. Right. And it's all about focusing on the customer. So you, you couldn't be just one element of the values of the company. You couldn't just be someone who just had the dedicate, the focus of being a warrior. You, we are also serving our customers. Um, and a, a lot of times companies don't look at, you're not just serving the external customers, you're also serving your internal customers. So an example right. of, of having a servant's heart would be uh, in our organiz in Southwest organization, think about um, how the peanuts and the Cokes and the cold beer gets on the aircraft. Well, that's done by what's called a provisioning agent. And that person's primary audience is, uh, obviously, the ultimate is the customer, but in the meantime, they're serving the flight attendants. So right. their flight attendants have everything they need to be able to ultimately serve uh, the customers. So I think it's a lot of times companies miss that step. Uh, they're focusing totally on the external customer, but you've got to really also focus on the internal customer to make sure that all of the employees have everything they need to do the best job they possibly can. If you make the division between a, a healthy culture and an unhealthy culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of business people determine the health of their business by their financials, right? But right. that's not necessarily culture. So how, how does organizational culture play into Profitability. So looking at, you know, talk about KPIs for employee engagement. De define KPI. Okay. So some of the uh, critical, uh, critical uh, performance indicators, okay. uh, key, perform key performance indicators okay. uh, that would be, uh, we'd be looking at in terms of a healthy culture. Uh, a lot of uh, organizations do employee surveys. And at Southwest, we had an employee survey as well. And one of my favorite questions was, describe your relationship uh, with Southwest Airlines. Is it a job or is it a stepping stone uh, to, a, to something in your career or is it really a calling? And 72% of the employees described their job as a calling. And I think that's where a lot of organizations want to be, where employees truly do understand that what they're doing is making a difference. And too often in corporate America, I don't think that's the case. And I think that's, what, oh my goodness, think about how you can move the needle for the purpose of your organization. It's certainly important today, is, especially with the millennials, right? Because they're very much looking for purpose and mission and, and a reason to be there, right? Absolutely. And you don't have to always work for a nonprofit. Uh, right. To <laughs> to have purpose, right? Not at all, to find purpose. <laughs> I like the fact that you guys have three filters because as a teacher, right, we, we, we actually, I, the human brain processes information in packets of three. So having three filters or having, I, I think it's, and it's a good lesson for our listeners, right? And, and so don't, don't have too many things because people can't Absolutely. process it, right? <laughs> You're absolutely right. And, and I, I love your example of, Threes. That's why we have nine one one. People yeah. can remember uh, three things. So yeah, if if you have seven values, you expect everyone to remember. They might remember four of them, but uh, having all of your employees remember seven values or ten credos, uh, that's going to be pretty difficult. It's pretty tough, right? But they can remember three. That right? they can remember three. They can just, remember just three. like a human resources person can remember these are the three filters that we're looking for right so we want them to be fun loving we want them to be a servant's heart and even i remember this because there's only three right that's and right we want them to have a warrior spirit right that's and i think that there's a great lesson there for all of us that we can't inundate people beyond their capability right You're so, so 
I'm curious about this. So when people come in, right, and so 72% of the people say they feel like working at Southwest is like a mission or a purpose, right, or a calling. Is that a result of hiring the right people and having them understand these are the types of people we want? Or is that a result of recalibrating them once they come into the system? It's bringing them in where they match your values of the organization coming in. Um, as you know, it's really hard to reprogram um, someone uh, in, who's 25 or someone who's 35, 45. It, reprogramming uh, isn't part of the process. Is bringing people in who identify with the values of your organization already. They're, they have exemplified those in other aspects of their life. And um, so they're a fit from a value standpoint coming into the organization. Where companies um, sometimes drop the ball is they may have it right about hiring according to their values, but they're not reinforcing that all along the lines of the employees. Okay. Okay. So it's through onboarding, it's got to go through training. Um, the leader has to reinforce it every day. It's got to be part of their recognition programs, and it's got to go all the way to performance appraisal. We have to be held accountable uh, if we're still living those values of the organization. So as a, as a senior vice president at Southwest Airlines, my performance appraisal uh, had aspects of it. If I, I was, I still living the values of the corporation. So everyone is held accountable to how they're living the values. Of, um, so were you still having fun, right? I mean, still having fun. Is that part of performance evaluation. And so, so <laughs> someone I worked with on a performance evaluation, man, they were knocking it out of the park with the warrior spirit, the servant's heart, but their fun-loving attitude wasn't always coming out. So we literally, as part of their performance appraisal, worked on what are some ways that you could demonstrate this Interesting. effectively. So um, it's an opportunity to, so it, uh, and people have to do it in their own way. So I want to move to something that maybe is a little bit more difficult to talk about, if you're open here. I'm open. All right. So we are facing great challenges today in male and female relationships in the workplace. You know, obviously we have the Me Too movement. We've had just almost it's like every day, you know. Um, in your viewpoint, right? Because you, you were very high level executive of a large American company and you're female, right? What needs to happen, and, and this is kind of an open discussion, but I think it's an important discussion and I wanna be able to create value here for people who are listening. And, and I guess the obvious question is, what advice would you have for men and what advice would you have for, for women, right? In, in the workplace as it relates to these relationships. And, but may, maybe there's something deeper, or maybe there's something more, a little bit more astute that you may bring to the table here. So I'll just ask the obvious question and, and that would be that, you know, what you know, what advice would you have for uh, men who perhaps are now struggling with, you know, how do I handle my relationships, you know, with, with, with the female gender? And, and, you know, I, I, I read a lot on culture all over the place, you know, and it's not just organizational culture and you see all kinds of responses from people or maybe perhaps reactions. So what, what's your thinking on this? What, what, um, what advice can you offer here? Well, I think it all starts with respect. And it's respecting, it's just respecting the individual. And um, I, I was lucky to work in an organization that didn't, didn't um, mark you, um, male, female, everyone had equal opportunity uh, to be involved in, in the organization. And we encourage um, non-traditional involvement. I mean, it was the airline uh, Southwest had the first female president in Colleen Barrett. Mm -hmm. So there was not that glass ceiling stigma um, okay. at West. Um, and it, it really does. It boils down to respect. And in and it also how critical in organizations if that um, if there are infractions, how quickly they are addressed. And okay. um, and knowing firsthand um, that um, how you have to address issues very quickly uh, and sometimes it's um, as simple as training um, and sometimes it's as difficult as termination 
uh, but it's having the courage as an organization uh, to address all of those all of those issues fairly. Um, and I, I, as a female, I I always. I always feel like females have to work um, harder uh, to be able to, for their expertise to be seen. Um, and um, I hope that isn't the case go, always going forward for the females that are going to follow. Uh, but I was very grateful. I, when I think about the women who were ahead of me in the workforce, um, who lived through the Mad Men age that I didn't have to go through. <laughs> 60s um, uh, and uh, just being present in the workplace, just their entire presence being questioned. Um, and, and then how much easier it was uh, when I came into the workforce in the 70s, um, I never felt that there was, I, I didn't run into issues of equality. In fact, my first job, um, I, I felt uh, that they were really looking to try to create more female role models in the organization. So I think, uh, and I hope today's a different day. We're seeing, I, um, I think a lot of us have been shocked by the things that are coming out that are still happening in organizations that's right. so dis And I um, think it was a huge wake up call. And um, I hope that things are very different um, uh, for, uh, for all workers, uh, moving forward. It's, um, it's a, it is a matter of respect. Yeah, there's the respect, but also I think what you said about handling things quickly. Yes. Because some of this people are coming 20 years later, you know, and, and, you know, you kind of, this needed to be handled then. Right. And, and, for whatever reasons, and I understand, you know, the reasons perhaps why not. And, and you know, but I, I think that the the counsel there of let's handle this now. Let's not let this grow. Let's not let this get out of hand. Let's not let this become something it doesn't need to become. Because right. when, when something solidifies, it becomes part of the culture. It does. And if you have a culture of that type of tolerance, for bad behavior, um, it's it's toxic, and people's pe um, and it perpetuates bad behavior because if it's not addressed very quickly, uh, it can be cancerous in the organization. So um, it's you've got to have the mechanisms where people can uh, pull a valve, um, have resources to go to uh, when when they need assistance, when they need help, when when they have an issue. So having um, you know call in lines, having resources available uh, where people can ask for help and assistance very quickly when they're confronted with a situation that they don't know how to deal with. Um, they need assistance. So uh, organizations have to set up those safety valves where people can come in and they're safe from retaliation. I think that's um, I think that's the reason a lot of people haven't reported in the past is because of fear of some type of retaliation down the line. Okay, especially from people perhaps who are more more powerful or absolutely, absolutely, and uh, those barriers have to be broken down. So when we talk about culture and leadership, I I have a a belief that um, people drive data and culture drives people, right? But people also create culture, right? And so, so it is true, especially in organizational culture, that that vision comes from the leadership, and they and then as you're saying now, you bring in the people who match that vision, right? And, and match those beliefs and norms and values and, and the things that, that we want from a leadership standpoint. There is a, you know, when, when we talk about, we talk about, for example, empathy, which, which when, when I talk about it, I talk about it, I learned to be passionate about other people. As you kind of viewed in Southwest and as you're working with other countries, uh, excuse me, with other companies and maybe countries, I don't know, um, perhaps, right? Um, but with other companies, how important is empathy in this process and, and how do you see that applying in, in, in a successful leader's life? Absolutely. Um, well, one of the things in your book uh, really struck me, uh, and you talked about in, in uh, the area of empathy, you talked about the importance of leaders getting out, getting out of their office. Right. And I think that's, I think that's a 
a great piece of advice. Um, and uh, one of the things we did at Southwest Airlines, we had something called Leaders on Location, uh, mm -hmm. where leaders adopted um, different locations. Um, so the top 300 leaders in the organization would adopt uh, various locations and spend time in those organizations because that's really um, the only uh, spending time, devoting time is the way you get to know uh, people in your organization and you can walk in their shoes and, and understand their problems. You know, there's a um, television show called Undercover Boss right. where the boss goes out. Well, we always laughed at Southwest. We could never do that because our leaders are so visible. They're so they would know them. Oh. They would but they're already there, right? So there's no amount of disguise that wow. would be possible. But because we really encourage that, uh, going out, spending time. Um, at, I know every Thanksgiving, that's one of the most um, concentrated travel times in, in the industry. Um, and um, we would always go out and help push wheelchairs, um, uh, facilitate, you know, getting the luggage moved along. Uh, but one of the things I generally would do would. Uh, push wheelchairs, and man, was I sore the next day, uh, just from uh, all the muscle it requires to push wheelchairs all day long, uh, but it really gives you um, a, an understanding of what the employees are going through, their, the demands on their time, um, and um, I noticed any time I would wear um, something like a uniform uh, that would be, um, our employees would be wearing, People sometimes um, treat people in uh, uniforms, they don't see them. They mm. truly don't see them as individuals. Mm -hmm. And that was a key lesson for me uh, that I've uh, tried to overcorrect. Uh, mm. So anytime I see someone in a service um, environment and in a uniform, I really try to see them as an individual and honor their individuality because too often, um, in our busy lives, uh, we pass over that person at the grocery store, um, that person at the gas station, uh, that person at the restaurant that's serving us, and really taking the time to honor them as individuals and thank them for the service that they're giving us. Typically with cultural mastery, we're focusing on that individual leader, right? And really working for that internal transformation of that person. And you're working in the macro as it relates to organizational culture, which is really driven by a lot of individuals, right? And, and so just in your experience, because we're, we're really, from our standpoint at least, we're working with, with leaders and, and you know, how do we create that internal transformation first so they can in fact lead external transformation? In, in your view of things, how prepared are most leaders today to actually lead positive external transformation? Generally, there is the extreme desire uh, from the leadership level. They may not have all the mechanisms in place that will allow them to do so. So why um, I try to be very um, direct with, with organizations because it's not one size fits all. Um, one organization might not have all the communication devices in place. It may not have the mechanisms to perpetuate the messages. Uh, throughout the organization. Um, their employees that might be in a remote work location might not ever see uh, leadership or hear messages from leadership. So what, what can be done to bring the leadership to remote locations? It, it's not one size fits all. And there are different things in an organization that might need to, to be corrected. Training might need to be one of the things that need uh, needs to be addressed in an organization um, because the, the training isn't thorough enough. So it's really listening to what's what the weaknesses are in the organization, what employees are giving you in terms of feedback that need to be corrected. Employees know um, what's going on and what's not working um, so they can perform at their best. So uh, the ultimate is having empowered employees who can act like owners who are representing your org who uh, are representing your organization every day. They're acting like owners. They're empowered to make the right kind of decisions for their, for your organization. But just creating that culture where people feel the freedom to, to be honest, be transparent, be open without repercussion against them for that level of transparency, right? That, that's part, part of the culture that one would want to create. So 
Absolutely. I have an associate who always reminded us that feedback is a gift. And that's true. Feedback is, um, it's sometimes hard to give, but if your employees have the comfort levels that you want, you want that kind of open environment when they know this form that you're having us fill out, why can't we do it this way? So it's allowing that innovation uh, in your, in your organization, al allowing that kind of input and an empowerment. Well, hopefully we're all listening. Uh, Ginger, you have a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience, and uh, a lot of good for all of us. So if someone wants to contact you, it's unstoppablecultures.com. Is that correct? Absolutely, unstoppablecultures.com. And if someone is interested in your fellowship, they can find that there as well. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. The information's on the website. It's awesome. the Unstoppable Cultures Fellowship. It's going to be in November in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and you'll be hearing about lots of great experts from uh, not only Southwest Airlines, uh, but uh, Disney, uh, the Navy SEALs, and uh, Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, right? So, which has, has their own very unique culture, right? At, so. Outstanding organizations, and awesome. each different in different industries. Right, right. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's Appreciate already, you being on CultureCast. It's awesome. So much fun. <laughs> This is big <laughs> Appreciate you. you. Thank you, you so much. Mm -hmm.